This episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. With pedals like the Snow Day Delay, the Pep Rally Fuzz, the Trash Panda, and my personal favorite, the Science Fair, which is two classic dirt pedals in one with a mid-boosted overdrive on one side, a black lab rat circuit on the other, and a blend knob to blend between them to find the perfect classic stacked dirt sound you're looking for, it's hard not to find something you'll love. Mark builds all of his pedals by hand in Syracuse, New York, where he also works as a full-time educator. In addition to the super fun graphics on their pedals, Mark also offers custom artwork. Want your dog's face on a pedal? He can do it. Want your face on a pedal? He can make that happen too. Go over to summerschoolelectronics.com and make sure to tell them that 40 Watt Podcast sent you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to 40 Watt Podcast. I'm so excited. I'm your host, Philip Carter. I realized, Joey, I realized a couple of weeks ago that I never say my name on this podcast. I never say my name. Like I, so I'm like every, every, I'm going to start saying I'm your host, Philip Carter. So you know who I am. So that if you see me commenting in Facebook groups and whatnot, you know who the heck this is. Um, We're going to get some housekeeping out of the way real quick uh, because I'm really excited about this episode. Um, Listeners, thank you for all your support. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, make sure you hit the subscribe icon and the bell thing. Uh, if you're listening, whatever your podcast player's version of subscribe, follow, whatever it is, please do that. Please rate and review. Do all those things. It's totally free and it helps this podcast. If you want to do a little more, you can always go over, like the intro said, to patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast and you can help keep this show going. And if you support the show, I will read your name at the end of the episode like I read all of my Patreon supporters at the end of this episode. So come on, right? I mean, you get your name heard by doesn't okay it's actually hundreds but <laughs> hundreds of people every week it's wonderful so come on um yeah in fact i am a patreon supporter of the brothers landreth which i'm you can find the link for their patreon below as well um and patreon's great actually it's the only album credits i have to my name now um hey there you go yeah, yeah. there you I, go uh, so we're going to talk about that here in a second, but first, Joey, uh, my guest today, y'all, is Joey Landreth of the Bros Landreth, or the Brothers Landreth, and uh, of course, Joey Landreth uh, Solo Project. How are you, sir? I am fantastic. I'm uh, getting over a bit of a sinus infection, which is a bummer, but other than that, oh yeah, you know, great. Yeah, so you are, we're going to jump right into this, though. You are literally coming off a couple of days ago, a Juno Award for best contemporary roots album that's right yeah we uh we were over in edmonton over the weekend and uh yeah we were nominated i uh uh dave and i we kind of had like when we found out that we were nominated we sat down and we're like i feel like this is not our year for for this Mm -hmm. uh not not because we didn't think the record was good or not because like down with the industry, just like it, we, it just didn't feel like it was our year. So we really prepared ourselves to watch somebody else walk away with it. And the category right. was stacked with, you know, like it, funny story, uh, the, uh, a band called fortunate ones who I was on tour with opening up for them. I was opening up for them solo back in, I sh- really should remember this, uh, 2018. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, so I had never done any East Eastern uh, East Coast Canada touring before. So like, like the furthest East we really ever get is Montreal. Okay. Uh, and and like Eastern Canada from Western Canada is pretty hard to get to because uh, it's just such a massive country. And there's not a there's it's not like the states where there's like a major center every three or four hours. It's like right. you know you play Montreal and then you've got like a <laughs> 10 hour drive to the next town, you know, like for us from Winnipeg, the next, our next main market that we play is Saskatoon. And that's, that's like an eight hour drive North Northwest. So it's anyway, all that to say, uh, I was out on tour opening for those guys. And the, and that was the weekend or that was the trip that my wife and I decided to elope and we got married while we were on tour. And so fortunate ones, uh, Andrew and Kat were our only attendees at our wedding. They were, they were our witnesses (laughs) And they also kitted out their their uh, Dodge Grand Caravan to be like a 
a wedding chariot to drive us to this little tiny town where we got married. It was it's just beautiful. So the category was stacked with people that we we love and adore and admire. And so we was just like, I, I, I was really excited to watch one of our friends win. And when they when they said our name, it was like, I, I, obviously, I'm so pumped. But I was a little like, oh, damn it. I really wanted to watch like... <laughs> You know, the East Pointers win, or I wanted to watch the Fortunate Ones win, which, you know, it might sound ridiculous, but, you know, you just cheer your friends on. But anyway, all that to say, uh, we're, we're thrilled and, and, uh, the, we, we won the award for our most recent record, which, um, is an album that Dave, my brother and I, we, it means a lot to us. Uh, we put a lot into this record, a lot of heart and soul. I mean, you always put a lot into what you're doing, but this record was, uh, extra special we made it during the pandemic and it was just he and i and our producer murray in this room you know working on the working on the record i was waiting for Joni to be born you know it was just it it, it's just an incredible incredibly meaningful uh work for us and so to get to get an award for it is uh just really special anyway all that to say well i I was it was pretty fun. I was able to actually watch the the ceremony live on um I was able to watch it on YouTube because it was broadcast. And then yeah. it's really it was really great cuz so before y'all accepted the award uh Dave uh for those of you who don't know David the bassist and the other brother in Bros Landreth um actually sent a video to the Discord for your Patreon supporters of y'all sitting at the table like showing that y'all were there cuz somebody had shared the link in there and um, it was just a fun little experience. And then after this weekend, I actually spent the weekend listening to all those other nominees. And you're right. That yeah. was an absolutely stacked category. All of those bands and groups are incredible. So yeah. I got to discover some really cool new music uh, through the process. Oh, man. Uh, I, thank you. Thank you for going to do that because, uh, uh, you know, uh, that category is, is really, really in terms of Canadian roots music contemporary roots music like that's that's the creme de la creme for canadian roots and so it's really it's really cool of you to check that out and and uh you know we're doing good stuff up here you know like yeah. not just not just us but but sort of canadian roots uh roots music and uh i'm very i'm very proud of everybody doing what they're doing yeah well that's my genre that's that's my vibe you know i i most listeners to the show know i'm a blues guy and uh but i'm also an americana guy like because I'm, I'm in Mississippi down where like it all kind of mixed together and became, you know, we got everything from Robert Johnson to Elvis Presley coming out of here. And so, yeah, uh, really, really got in, get into all of that roots music, uh, which I typically just think of as Mississippi music in general. So uh, it was really great. Re- of course, great to see y'all win uh, coming off the back of uh, by now y'all have talked about it ad nauseum. Uh, your uh, your song made up mind the Bonnie Raitt cover of your made up mind, which is so fun yeah. to say, isn't it? Although I did, yeah. I did watch live footage of y'all playing in Minneapolis where you jokingly said after playing the song, that was a Bonnie Raitt cover. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was great. Um, it won a Grammy for, uh, best. Oh, I got to get this right. Best Americana performance. I think Correct. I, yeah. yeah. Look at that. Look at that memory. Who says I'm getting old? I do. I say I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> so, there's so many things we, we can talk about and, and I, I've been really fortunate to, to be able to get to know you over the years. And, you know, we, we text back and forth every now and again, when you have time, cause you're wildly busy, you, you don't know how to stop. Um, I don't. <laughs> and so this is where I'm going to disappoint some of the guitar playing followers of this podcast. I am not going to ask you your tuning. I'm not going to ask you your string gauge. I'm not <laughs> going to ask you any of those questions. I'm not going to ask you to detail the um, obscene pedal board you toured with the last tour. Um, you, there's a video that if people want to, they can go check that out. There's other things. Um, so I asked in my Discord, and normally I save uh, Patreon questions and, and Discord questions for the end, but I really, this, someone asked the question I really wanted to get into. And I'm really interested in your process as a songwriter. I want to understand, because you actually said during uh, that same show, that Minneapolis show, it, this is a great quote. I love this quote. You said that, um, I really love having songs. I really hate writing songs. So is it, a, is it like a really tough process for you in the songwriting process? We'll be right back. This podcast is supported in part by String Joy Strings, 
I'm a snob. At least that's what people tell me. I'm never okay with good enough. And that's where String Joy strings come in. They're better than good enough. They're the best. String Joy are making some of the finest strings available today right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. They offer custom sets, balanced tension, coded strings, the works. If you need it, they can probably make it happen. You should be using String Joy strings, and if you're going to order from them, you really could help this podcast out by clicking the affiliate link down in the description or show notes below. You get amazing strings, I get a little bit of that back to help the show keep going. It's a win-win situation. Get your String Joy strings today. It it has been. It's funny. I'm trying to I'm trying to reframe that narrative for myself. I I I think part of like it's not that i hate songwriting and i feel like you know it's it's cute to say that and and people people laugh at it you right. know when when especially i don't know it it's it's a weird thing for me because i think part of it is that because i'm an instrumentalist first you know i spent i spent the first 10 or 15 years of my career like being really really focused on not necessarily being the best guitar player, but being the best side person that I could. So oh, sure. a lot of the time that I spent sort of skill building, practicing, working on things was to be the best <laughs> sort of uh, uh, side guy that I could be. Um, you know, so I'm like really good at learning songs. I'm really good at, at, at recreating sounds. I'm, I'm like, those, those are, those are things that I really valued uh, when I was working with other people. And so when it comes to being creative, um, that's, I have a fluency musically. Uh, and it, and it, and it seems to translate across all the instruments that I play. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not particularly an incredible keyboard player, but I'm, I would say that I'm more comfortable coming up with things on keys than I am necessarily as a writer. And it's, and it's, uh, um, you know, I'm trying to interact with that, uh, and, and sort of figure out what some of the hang up is. But I think, I think that the reality is, is that um, I am very confident as an instrumentalist. And so I feel like my ability to tell a story um, through uh, a guitar or a piano or something like that um, is a lot easier than actually telling you a story. And so the, the process of, that writing and storytelling is very vulnerable. Um, and so I think there's a lot of things that get, that can get in my way, which I think I, I, I've, I've, I've heard from people who, who like my music, that that's a surprise. Um, and I think it's, you, you just assume that every, you know, every musician, artist, creative, whatever, is just constantly pouring art out of themselves. And, and that's just not, not necessarily the case for me. Uh, and I know that I, um, I actually recently started listening to the song exploder podcast. Okay. My, my wife recommended it and she was like, I know that, you know, this, this isn't really your thing, but yeah, I think you should check it out. And so I listened to, um, a couple of episodes of that and I actually found it incredibly inspiring to discover that some of, some of these artists that I just think like, Leanne Lahavis, who I, I really adore her music and her guitar playing and, and all of that stuff. And to hear her kind of like, oh, this is how I put this song together and just be like, oh, wow, that's that's how I put a song together. So if that's how Leanne Lahavis puts the song together then, and, and that's how I put a song together, then I, I must be doing OK. And I found it was really uh, uh, to kind of listen through the process of a lot of artists that I admire it was, it was freeing in a way. And I think I realized like, and like, we're talking like this happened this weekend. Like I listened, I started wow. listening to this podcast on the airplane to the Junos. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I kind of was like, after touring for a year, sort of telling that story on stage and talking about how I kind of hate songwriting. Right. Uh, I I've sort of had this discovery that it's not that I hate songwriting. It's just that I'm a, I'm a little afraid of it. And, uh, uh, and I think that that is, that's a very human thing human thing is to uh not know what to do with the things that you're afraid of and so uh i'm i'm starting to like try to reframe that narrative so all that to say you know the songwriting process for me is is definitely a struggle and um i have 
uh, I, I've always kind of struggled with output. Um, yeah. And, to, you know, like uh, anybody who's who knows my band and knows our catalog, the first song that I finished, ever finished from top to bottom, like here, finally, I've written, you know, two verses and a chorus and a bridge was a song called our love, which is, which is the opening track off our first record. Yeah. It took me seven, seven years to finish that. <laughs> you know, I'm so glad I can relate to something because <laughs> I can't, I can't relate to your guitar playing, but I can at least relate to the songwriting struggle that, cause that's so hard for me too. And do you get a point where you start to come up with something and we've all got internal critic and I, do, I and I don't want to like mention specifically internal critic cause we've all got that. But like, there's actually a point where like I and I I rarely can get past this threshold, to where I just get so frustrated not being able to get the thing I want to sound like I want or the, the right lyric or the right melody line, and it's just like I I like start to get angry. Like I get f- so frustrated, I'm almost angry, and I'm like I gotta walk away from this. I can't do this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I, I, you should interact with that. <laughs> <laughs> I should. I really. I should use that as fuel. To be honest, that should be. A, that should be energy to go into it. But uh, songwriting. But I is, mean, it, yeah. it's such a. It's such a personal. It's such an intimate and personal thing to do. And and I think like you probably experience the same thing that I do. Where it's like if somebody says, "Hey, Philip, like take a solo," you're like, "Okay." Yep. But if somebody's like, "Hey, Philip, tell me tell me a story about the intimate details of your life," like it's normal <laughs> for you to be like, "Ah." Uh, Give me a second, maybe. Yeah. And that's kind of what songwriting is. Even if you're trying to tell someone else's story, you, you can only share a story through your own experience. Even if you're telling someone else's, you know, your ability to, um, sorry, I got notifications going off here. Are you fine? Up. <laughs> um, so it, it's, I think it's very natural uh, to have those kind of, reactions and i and i get the same like i mean i'm not throwing guitars across the room but i'll definitely get to a point where i'm like you know what i i'm i'm now i'm now damaging the process i'm not i'm not yeah i'm not doing anything good and i i i think like i've i've heard people say you got to push through that you got to push you got to push you got to push and like i while i i i i get how that works for some people um and i and i don't uh I do not doubt the validity of that process that doesn't work for me, yeah. you know, and maybe it's, maybe I'm a bit stubborn and, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a fun little saying that uh, goes through our family with in, in relations, in relationship to my, myself, my brother and my dad. Uh, and it's nobody tells a landreth what to do. <laughs> and, and I'm not necessarily saying that that's a good quality. Right. But, you know, when when somebody comes in and goes, I really think you should do this. My first reaction is to go, well, I really think that you should go in yourself, you know, <laughs> kick rocks. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so uh, when it comes to that, like pushing, I, it just doesn't work. And it's not for me for me songwriting and guitar playing and recording and and everything it's a very delicate environment that needs to be fostered with care and gentleness for me and so i i really think like if i start to get to that point where i'm like i'm really frustrated with this i need to walk away yeah. i need to do something else and i think that that's not a narrative that we often support with artists because this, there's always this like you have to push, you have to work, you have to tour, you have to give music absolutely every single inch of who you are. I, I just think that's super unhealthy, you know. And and I'm like, I'm I'm a I'm a recover I'm 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 a recovering alcoholic. I've been in recovery for eight years. Uh, I've struggled with um, with my mental health. I've struggled with addiction. I've struggled with uh, you name it. And um, I think it's it's because we push artists to the brink and we think that that's where creativity lives and and I don't I don't think that creativity doesn't live there but I I really do wholeheartedly believe that it doesn't have to exclusively live there and if if we you know if if we allow there to be nuances in how we make art I I strongly believe that people like Hendrix, Janis Joplin, all these people would still be here you know yeah 
Like that's a good point. And and I mean, I know that this is that we've wandered pretty far away from the songwriting topic, but I think it's all part of it because we we just we just spin this tale of you have to suffer, and you know the reality is is everyone on this planet is already suffering enough. We all struggle with some what, something one way or another. The I think the key to making good art is allowing yourself to be curious and treating yourself with kindness. And you can still be gentle with yourself and write a sad song about how much something hurt, but you don't have to relive it. And you don't have to kill yourself in order to do it. Um, I don't mean that literally. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. in terms of in, in work, um, maybe a bad choice of words, but uh, you know, you know what I mean? And I, yeah. I, I really believe that. And I, and I think like the, for me, and what this is why uh, our most recent record means so much to me is that we just chased our curiosity around. And that's why this record is different than the ones that we've made. And that's why I think because of the challenges that we had in terms of making it, because it was made during COVID and the, and the um, w- we had some pretty strict COVID rules here at the, at the height of the pandemic. So we were only, we were only able to gather in groups of uh, three or less and yeah. so we couldn't get a band into the room. So, you know, and I've talked about this um, uh, in other interviews, but we, we couldn't get a full band into the room. And so we were like, well, how how are we going to finish this record? Because we we didn't quite have all we, we we started making the record at a time when the when the restrictions were looser. And so sure. we did we, we we did gather with a drummer in the room and we didn't quite get everything that we needed. And so we decided to start again and by the time we decided to start again the covid covid had kind of sprung up again and so the restrictions were heavier and we were like well if we can't get a drummer in this room then we might as well hire someone from abroad and if we're going to hire somebody from abroad we should send some emails to our heroes and so we ended up getting one of our heroes to play on the record and it was such a different way to make an album and it would never have worked if we weren't willing to chase curiosity, it, I would have sabotaged that. Uh, if we'd, if we'd have been forced to make a record that way, like five years ago, I never would have been able to do it. Um, so I don't know. I, again, I'm wandering pretty far away from this <laughs> topic, but, <laughs> no, you're, but you're I good. do think that as, as an uh, umbrella conversation, um, all, all of that stuff kind of comes to it. So I think like for, for me, it is, it is well and truly like, chase your curiosity and if you're a guitar player but you find yourself wanting to play a different instrument don't stop yourself from doing that you know i see a i see a keyboard right behind you yeah and i had to learn in college and so for for my degree i had to take a couple years of piano and so then i didn't touch one again after i graduated for years and then i was like you know i really like keys and that's something i don't think you and i have actually ever actually had a conversation about uh to to kind of pivot a little bit in other instruments and creativity. Um, I tell people all the time that if I had it to do all over again, which obviously we don't, you know, that's, that's a really inane conversation route to go down because you can't do it. But I probably would have learned the Hammond organ instead of taking up guitar and just played Hammond and just been a B3 player. Like that's what I do, (laughs) but I know you're really into Hammond organ as well. So yeah, we, we haven't talked about that, but that's, there's something about that instrument that really speaks to me to the point that I find myself actively looking for a B3, uh, but like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to build a studio uh, in, in my, you know, on my, on my lot that I have here in the backyard. And um, I, I don't have anywhere to put a B3. So I'm like, I've got to wait gotta wait that's gotta get done first i need a space to put it in Um, well i mean if you can find yourself an m3 yeah i because that's what i i had an m3 or was it an m3 or was it an l i had something i had either i think it was an m series um and it just eventually died and yeah as they do yeah, and the the to service it would have been the same cost it would have been for me. Well, actually, it was a lot more than for me to just find another working one, because people practically give them away down here. You oh could, man, I got I got my M three off of uh, Kijiji, which is like our sort of uh, uh, Craigslist equivalent, and I found it for a hundred bucks. <laughs> That's and what then, I paid for and, mine. <laughs> and then and, and when I when I emailed the guy. He he was like he, I think he thought that I was heckling 
because he was like, listen, I, it's like a, a hundred bucks. If you're not, if you can't give me a hundred bucks for it, then uh, I'm just going to cut it into pieces and part it out. And I, and I was just like, oh no, man, a hundred bucks is fine. But then I put, <laughs> I put $1,100 worth of work into it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was the thing with mine. I, I was, wasn't in a place to do that with it. I did a lot of work myself. Uh, like the rotor, um, the, the tone wheel was actually stuck. And so I spent right. like a whole weekend doing nothing but getting that to turn again on its own. And yeah. Oh yeah. It's, oh it's yeah. A, it's a whole I mean, that's, experience. that's, that's a thing when, when you get into, when you get into playing Hammond, uh, you also get into servicing Hammond organs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I like, I have learned more about electronics uh, in, in the two years or three years since I bought my M3 than um, the, uh, my entire you know, adult life owning a soldering iron. Yeah. And, um, and when you but, open up the back of those, the, if you think opening up an amp is intimidating and the number of yeah, wires look that in run the back places, of, a ha- of a Hammond organ. Oh, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Uh, and that's the thing about those old organs. And I hesitate to even say this on the podcast, but I'm not the first. There's people who listen to much more popular podcasts that have talked to this, talked about this. There's more than a hundred dollars worth of tubes in the back of an M3 organ. Like oh, yeah. some of the you, people are harvesting those things just for the tubes that are in them. Now, I think I've got, I've got a whole box full of tubes that came out of a couple of organs over the years that are just, I may need them someday. They're vintage. You know, some of them are a couple of them were RCAs. A couple of them were Mullards. I'm like, there's good tubes in these oh, yeah. old, these old Hammonds that people are just throwing away. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. It's a wild time, but yeah, I, I like the idea of chasing other instruments. But pivoting back to songwriting just a little bit, because because there were some very pointed questions. This is this is going to be uh, so. Correct me if I've got information wrong. Uh, so when you lived in Toronto, you were in a writers group with people like Donovan Woods and some other folks. Am I correct here? Uh, I wasn't in a writers group, but okay. I did do I did do some writing with Donovan. Um, I'll, I'll let you finish asking your question because there's there's probably a. Uh, there are probably more lines of truth worth speaking to rather <laughs> yeah. than uh, just well, elaborating on that. So, so I had a listener ask this question, and I, this is why it was new to me. I didn't know about this. Um, apparently, there was a, a writers group that met weekly. Uh, then they would all meet and bring songs, and whoever uh, didn't bring a song had to pay for breakfast. Oh, <laughs> no, yeah. that's a that's a myth. But I okay, do. That's I a do, myth. Uh, it's, it's so. Um, I was a part of a virtual writers group okay. that had that had people like um, uh, Liam Duncan, who played keys in the in the Brothers for uh, for a couple of tours. Um, Roman Clark, who played drums in my band for a while. Mm-hmm. A guy named Dylan McDonald, who goes whose performer's name is um, Field Guide, uh, who my my brother and our manager Stu both managed together. And he's a brilliant songwriter. Another guy by the name of Chris Ulrich who's a beautiful guitar player and a beautiful songwriter. And uh, the rules behind that were you submit a song every Sunday. I think it was by midnight or maybe it was Saturday by midnight. I can't remember. Um, and if you don't meet the deadline, then you're, you're out of the writer's group for that stretch. And then when, and oh. then when, it, when it starts over, then you, can, <clears throat> yeah. So, so the whole thing was to try to finish writing a song, a, a song a week, essentially. Um, which I, of which I only completed one. Uh, and, <laughs> I was going to that was gonna be my next question based on our previous conversation. Yeah. Um, but the song that I got out of that was, was the first single off of my, uh, my last solo record uh, for, and it was called forgiveness and it wound up being um, a good song for me. Yeah. It's um, a fantastic song, but yeah. And that, that did happen while I was living in Toronto and I did do some writing with Donovan Woods while I was living in, uh, Toronto and I wrote um, Still Feel Gone uh, and Time Served which were also pretty big songs for me uh, not necessarily commercially but within within sort of the my I hate to use this word but my fan base like pe- people who like my music like those sure. songs um, and so those two songs were written with Don and uh, I played on a record of his uh, also while I was living there, I think in 16 or 17. And, uh, um, and uh, that, yeah, that was a blast and made a lot of friends during that time. But yeah, there's, so there's some, some small truths yeah. in there. 
uh, but a, a little bit of uh, telephone is happening. Yeah, the game of telephone. It's, it's always yeah. fun. It's always fun to hear these things and and then figure out what was actually going on. Because <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. so in in the songwriting that I love the idea. And, and we, we've talked about this just a little bit, the idea of the forced songwriting, the, hey, we're going to meet on this day at this time and you bring a song, everybody do this. I've actually got a, a book that I need to actually do this. Ex- and it's more of an exercise. You know, you're not expecting to get the best result out of it. It's just, hey, make sure you're flexing this muscle this week is, is yeah. the thing. It's the consistent because uh, I, I know some some Nashville songwriters, some folks I went to college with who have found success in, in the Nashville songwriting scene and, and as artists on their own. Um, and one of the things that they talked to me about there is that there's always that artistic side of waiting for inspiration to strike. And then they're very much no, 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 no. You train yourself to be creative. You you just keep doing yeah. it. You keep doing it, and then you eventually just it starts happening because you set side aside time aside to do this thing. And uh, there's a there's a book that I bought trying to break that you know that barrier that I still haven't done this, but it's a book called The Frustrated Songwriters Guidebook for the Frustrated Songwriter or something along those lines. I'm looking over at my bookshelf as if I can read it over there without my glasses on. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I've misplaced my glasses and my whole world is uh, a blur. Oh, dude, what but, a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, it they had this exercise where they said, take 24 hours and write 20 songs in 24 hours. And you're supposed to do it with other people and then come together and share your songs. And it's not right. Whether it's good or not, it that's irrelevant. It does yeah. not matter. It's just you, you, you wrote 20 songs. And the the concept is, That within 24 hours to write 20 songs, you don't have time to think about, is this good? Is this derivative? Is this this genre? Is this this style? Will people like it? You don't have that kind of time. You just have to write. You just got to flex that. And I love that concept. And I think uh, Nickel Creek, when they used to be on the road, Sean, Sarah, and Chris had a... when. I think it was just on their days off, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was on show days too. That sounds wild to me. But they had this rule where they wrote a song a day and would all come together at the end of the day to play those songs. And That's insanity. It, it is. It's really wild. Yeah. And they would do that on tour. And so it, it's it's that whole idea of you're not going to get better at it if you don't do it. You can't just wait for you to feel right to do it. Do you yeah. find some of that as well? I, I definitely do. And I, I think like I have um, I have extra grace for myself because for me, my my creative sort of environment encapsulates like a lot of different mediums. So it's, you know, and I think like if I was doing more career writing, uh, like some of those Nashville writers like that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I'm. I'm making records, I'm producing, I'm mixing, uh, I build my own pedal boards, I build my brother's pedal boards. <laughs> like my creative outlet is vast. And so I I really do leave myself a lot of room when it comes to songwriting to go like, you know, there's, my wife and I were just talking about this yesterday. And because she's, she's an intensely creative person and she's really, really good at Oh, she's so good at a lot of things, but she was like, I think about it. Like we have buckets Mm -hmm. and, and these buckets have a certain amount of creative fluid in it. And, you know, if you dedicate 25% to this and 25% to that and 25%, but at the end, at the end of the day, you only have 25% left. And so, and that's kind of, that's, I think for me, that's why I'm not, a fast writer because I just, I just am doing a lot of other things. And I also like to do a lot of other things, you know, I enjoy. So I, while I definitely agree with, um, with that, you can, you can build that access to your creativity as a skill. I don't disagree, but the reason why it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily work for me as a writer is because I'm also doing so many other different things. And like, I love the idea of trying to, you know, try to, trying to write while you're on the road. But the reality for us is like, we are, Dave and I are driving the van. We're tour managing, we're doing merch, you know? And so, uh, 
I'm sure if we had a driver and a tour manager, there'd be a lot more hours in the day to sit yeah. around and write songs. But that's, you know, and it's not, it's not like a woe is me thing. Like we certainly, we certainly could um, find a way to bring a TM and a, and, you know, on the road, but Dave and I are just too frugal and we, and we like the work. That's the other thing is we really enjoy the work. So it's, and at the end of the day too, we're, we're traveling with a group of people who travel really well. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know why I'm talking about this. I'm, I'm getting sidetracked, but all that to say is that my, I think my main point is that it certainly is circumstantial and what, what I find to be maybe sometimes damaging about those kind of ideas is that they are discounting the the human factor, sure. which is, you know, all of those all of those ideas in a vacuum are brilliant and they work. But as soon as you start to apply the the filter of life, you know, and for me, yeah, I'm 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 a session player, I'm a producer, uh I hesitate to call myself a mixing engineer, but I have mixed things. Um and I'm also a dad and I'm also yeah. a husband. I'm a brother and I'm a son. And I really, really value those things um, in a way that in, in my past I didn't. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll never go back to valuing work more than, more than time with my family. I'll never do that again. Um, and so I, I think that, I think that you take all of these ideas and you, you take them with a grain of salt and you figure out a way, you know, I, I do love the idea of of having some kind of goal in terms of writing in order to to build that as a skill. I think that's a good idea. But I think the other thing that's really important about what you mentioned, it's like forcing yourself to write 20 songs in 24 hours. It, it What it does is it removes you from the idea that something has to be objectively good. And I think that there's something really valuable in that in terms of creativity. Yeah. Because as creators, we also are wrapped up in the idea that absolutely everything we have to make has to be something of incredible integrity and value. And yeah. I think the only, like, you know, people will go, I haven't written any good songs. It's like, yeah, but you've written songs, so you're a songwriter. That's it. You know, it, nobody is saying, are you a, are you a singer <clears throat> and good songwriter? No, people just say you're a singer-songwriter. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so... Like I've written so many garbage songs that we will <laughs> never ever see the light of day, and the the thought of people hearing them terrifies me. Yeah. Uh, but I think that I think that the if your goal is to make something, then that's all you have to do is make something. And that, and like for me, what I what I'm really excited to after sort of getting inspired by this the Song Exploder podcast is to just get into the studio and and just make stuff like yeah. p- pick up my guitar and play something and build off of it and not be tied to the idea that it has to turn into a, a song that's going to go on a record, but just like, just make stuff. And that's ultimately what I really love to do the most. And what I love about making records and all that stuff is, is just playing in the sandbox. Like we, my, my studio is called sandbox sandbox recording because it I was just, we're just a couple kids playing in the sandbox. So I don't know. I, I, I do love this conversation because I think it's it's really um it's really important to talk about like what the definition of creativity is. Yeah. And and try to divorce it from having to create something objectively good. You know, if you if you and it sounds it might sound like uh you know, people are always belly aching about like giving away like uh uh, uh, thanks for participating awards, but it it, it is oh, kind of yeah. like when it comes to, when it comes to creativity, uh, the only the only metric is di- that you need to measure is did I make something? Yeah, it's you know, and that's what I'm always telling people who are like, give me some advice, like just don't don't worry about it being good, just make something and keep making things and recycle your old ideas, steal from yourself constantly. Uh, plagiarize yourself. Uh, who gives a shit if you've used a line in a song already? Use it again if it works better. Like I'm not precious about any of that stuff. Yeah. And I and I think that like um, what I like about sort of what you described in terms of like some songwriter exercises are just the push to um, to just open up open up your mind to just making stuff and and not not being precious about it. And I lost my train of thought. I can't remember what I was going to say in oh. response to that. No, it's fine. But, 
But it, it's the same same vein of, and, and you see memes and you see images and inspirational quotes on social media about things like uh, being good at something is not a prerequisite to enjoying doing it or, you know, if you do something, you are that thing. I, I really had that hit me a few years ago. Um, a few years ago, I ran my first marathon, which those of you that have seen me, you know that I'm not built for running. That's not who I am. It's fine. Um, but I, I actually enjoy running, enjoyed. Uh, I've not really done a lot since I got COVID last year, and the lungs have really not appreciated it, but I'm working back up to it. Um, yeah. I've run a couple of marathons, but my first one was rough. My first one was very rough, and I had a couple of really inspirational moments on that. I don't want to turn this into man tackles physical feet, ha- comes out the other end, you know, a different person. But I had a couple of th- things where – I had trained for that run. I was ready. I I was like prepared. What I wasn't prepared for was um, my shoes rubbing me wrong that day. And I ended up with giant blisters on the bottom of both of my feet around mile 14. And uh, so mile 14, for those of you that don't want to do the math, that means I've still got 12 miles to go on blisters. And so it started to get painful. And I had a guy, well, I'll tell the the first, the really inspirational story, the one that made me finish, because I was real close to just calling, you know, medical and just quitting, like being done. And I was running next to this, uh, walking, and this woman walks up next to me, uh, dressed as Superwoman, I should mention, people dress up for marathons. Um, She walks up next to me and starts telling me, we just start chatting around mile 17. And she tells me this story, because I'm I'm running the St. Jude Marathon in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, it's a it's a charity that I really support, Children's Hospital. They do a lot in cancer research in children. And, um, and so she tells me the story of how she um, was living in Texas, was a single mom, uh, and her child was diagnosed with this extremely rare, extremely aggressive cancer. And Ugh. the broader brought they came to St. Jude. Uh, her son got into and and this is this is a little dark, and I'm sorry, y'all, uh, but got into uh, an experimental treatment where they were still trying to figure out if it worked. So obviously they're doing focus groups uh, and you have to do things where, you know, half the, half them get the medicine, half don't to see if the treatment actually works. Uh, Half get a placebo. Uh, And her son was in the half that got it and he lived. And she was telling me this story because she was talking about how the next year, this was in 2017. I I ran this one, 2017. And so uh, she told me that, and in for 2018, her son was turning 18 and going to run the St. Jude with her the next year. Cool. And I was like, okay, I can get through this. If she got through that and they got through that, I can get through yeah. this. But yeah. to, to bring it around to the, the other point, just cause that was like, that was the real life changing moment of that one. But at one point I was stopped because my feet were hurting. I was re you know, took my shoes off, readjust my socks, trying to figure out a way to continue even to walk this out. Right. And a guy running, stopped to check on me and he said are you okay marathoner and i was like yep just got some blisters i'll be all right he said all right see you at the finish line but just that moment cool. and he'll never know he'll never know that he was the person who did this but he called me a marathoner yeah. i am i am sitting on the side of the road with my trying to get my shoes readjusted to try to painfully walk through this and he called me a marathoner it didn't matter if i finished that thing in three hours or eight hours 10 yeah yeah exactly yeah i yeah i finished a marathon and yeah. the, you know it's the creating something makes you a creator create things the, you know you don't have they don't have to be good yeah man it, I, I there's so much there's so much in there dude like there's i think i think that one like one of the problems i i really feel is and you know certainly not trying at all to make it political in any way but is like the commercialization of music of of art and it's it's necessary yeah. i make my living off of off of art um uh, i would be a gigantic hypocrite if i was like you know i would stop making money like that and that's not what i'm saying but being able to divorce yourself from the idea of the value of what you're making can only be determined by if it, if it has commercial success. And I mean, I think that speaks to my career as an artist because like, I've, I I can't tell you how often people say, I wish you guys were more successful. 
And, and I, I say thank you because I think it, I think they mean well, but it's like, but you have no idea what I thought I was going to be doing <laughs> with my, with my music and <laughs> the things that I get to do for a living. Mm-hmm. I am, are beyond my wildest dreams. I never, ever, ever would have thought that the things that have happened to me in my music career have happened to me. And so when somebody says, I wish you were more successful, I'm just like, man, you have no idea how successful I am, you know, and I'm not, I I don't make a lot of money. I I make way more than I ever thought I was going to make, but I don't objectively make a lot of money at all. You know, I'm still, I'm still very much in the bottom of the middle class sort of, uh, lifestyle but it's more than i ever thought and so i feel even though uh objectively i'm not a wealthy person i feel wealthy because i make i make more than i ever thought i would you know anyway i don't know i i think like we um yeah and it's a hard thing to do it's a hard thing to do because you obviously want commercial success you want you want your music to do well i i was recently talking to a young guitar player who's having a moment and he was like, a lot of people are pushing me to go on the road and I don't really want to go on the road because I, I got this, I got this woman at home that I'm madly in love with and this life that I'm living that I really love and going on tour is going to change that in some way. I don't, I, you know, it's not yeah, necessarily yeah. going to make all those things go away, but it's going to change it. What, what do you think? Like, should I just tough it out? And I was like, you know what? You don't have to make your living 100% from from the songs that you make or the the gigs that you play in order to be uh, a a musician of great value and integrity. All you have to do is literally keep doing what you're doing right yeah, now. That's it. You know, and and you don't even have to keep doing it in the way that you're doing it. You know, and that's something that I wish I wish I would have understood when I was younger because. That, and that's the kind of balance that I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, I sacrificed a lot for my career. Uh, and my brother sacrificed a lot for his career. And although we wouldn't be where we are right now um, without some of the some of the tough stuff that we did, I don't necessarily know that it. it's I don't always feel like it was worth it. You know, yeah. and again, I'm not disappointed with where I'm at. I'm so thrilled with where we are. Sure. And, and I, and I don't think that I would necessarily change it, but if I'd have been, if I'd have realized that there was another way to do it, you know, and I think that that's, that's my goal, like sharing pieces of my story with people is that I just want you to think about like what you actually want, you know, cause like going on tour and playing shows for people is awesome. Yeah. But like when you go on tour, especially if you tour the way that I tour, um, you're not like going to Paris and walking through museums and looking at fine art. (laughs) Like you're staying in garbage, smelly hotels, driving yourself around in a van that you probably rented in England. So you're driving on the opposite side of the car on the opposite side of the road that that car was meant to drive on. You're humping your own gear. You're counting your own t-shirts. Don't get me wrong. I love all that stuff. But it's it's like after ten years of doing it, it's not necessarily as cool. No, <laughs> you know and, what it's, I mean? and it's not the fun wears off. <laughs> the The novelty of it wears off. It certainly does. I mean, the novelty of playing shows for people with like playing shows for people who love your music and p- making it with people that you love that never wears off. That's right. always going to be that's always going to be special. Um, but. Uh, it's easy to romanticize that stuff. And I mean, it's why so many, so many touring musicians struggle with addiction because it's not an easy life to live and it's easy to want to hide your, your pain because also you don't want to tell people that like, Hey, I'm living my dream, but it, it sucks. Yeah. You know, and nobody wants to hear that. But the reality is, is that, it's also simultaneously super awesome, but it's, it's also just a, it's a hard, it's a hard way to live your life. I'm not asking people to feel sorry for us. This is the life that we've chosen. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a hundred percent responsible for it, but I just like, I just wish that more people were talking about the, the, all of the, all of the reality of it. And like, I think like, you know, no matter how good a show is and how good a tour is, 
nothing is better than waking up and walking my daughter to daycare and talking to her about the day she's going to have. Nothing will ever beat that. And so I'm willing to sacrifice some time with her in order to, to maintain our quality of life. Um, but only as much as necessary, you know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, I don't know. I just like, um, uh, I don't know why I'm talking about all that. I lost my train of thought. No, again. it's fine. But, it's, uh, it's a good conversation, and it actually ties in. So last week I had uh, Meredith Coloma of Coloma Guitars, uh, another Canadian. She's over in Vancouver. Um, very good. Uh, she, uh, she, she, and I had this same conversation about knowing what your goal actually is, and and knowing what attaining it looks like like some people just want to be famous and that that was where where our conversation was some people just want to be famous but they don't yeah. really understand what being famous means like they just they want the glitz of and they don't want the 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 grittier backside of it and i really appreciate how openly uh you and david talk about this i think you did it on the recent uh karate in the garage uh which is a youtube series that y'all do did y'all brought it back so hopefully uh when y'all find you know those extra four hours that we keep begging for in the day uh, y'all can keep that going um yeah but you talked about how important like y'all could you you could go on the road do these massive six nine twelve month tours build the fan base even more but you're not willing to spend that time away from your family. You're not willing to interrupt the life you've got. Uh, so you do shorter runs and that, that means balancing a work life balance, uh, air quotes, yeah. that whole thing, but it's a real thing. It's, it's a real thing. And like, I think you touched on something because, um, well, I mean, just this morning I had to drive, I had to drive up to FedEx to pick up a package and, and after, uh, uh, after sort of my transaction was finished, the, the, the clerk behind the counter went, um, are you in the brothers Landreth? <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And she's like, I love your band. It's like, thank you so much. That's really a nice thing to hear. You know, we do have this sort of like l- sort of small, especially in Winnipeg, people are very, very, very proud of us here, which is, which is a beautiful thing. So we have this little corner of fame, you know, um, sure. But it that was never the goal that and it's and it's not like I'm I I don't wake up in the morning I'm like Frig I hope the person at the coffee shop knows who I am <laughs> you know and to be completely honest I, I'm a I'm a I'm a pretty introverted guy and yeah. I I I uh, as as much as it's hilarious that I'm like you know I'm a performer and a frontman for a living I, I'm pretty awkward and pretty shy. And so, you know, I, I definitely struggle with that side of what we do. Um, but if you, if your goal is to be famous, that is a, that is a never ending hunger. Yeah. You know, and you will never feed that beast. Like it will consume you and it's not a good life. You know, and I've watched, I work, I've worked for people that were just like, I don't care what kind of music I make. I just want to be famous. So I'll, I'll sing a country song and then put me into the room with a pop producer. I'll sing a pop song. I don't care what the song is about. I just want to be famous. And that's a dangerous place. Like if, yeah. if you, if you pursue your art with all your heart and you wind up famous, like probably most people who are in that situation are like, feel the same way that I do about my little sliver of sort of fame. I hate, I hate saying that, but <laughs> um, they probably, they probably, it, it, it's like having somebody tell you that they love your music is a beautiful thing, but mm-hmm. like, but, but the, but the, but having somebody be uncomfortable to talk to you or, or that, that sucks. Cause I just want somebody, I just want somebody to, to realize that we're just normal guys. Like, you know, uh, I, drive a 1997 Toyota Corolla, you know, like I'm not, <laughs> yeah. I'm not right. You know, I don't have a multi-car garage. I don't even have a garage. I just have a parking pad, <laughs> you know, I, I, I like, so I, I, that, that stuff I definitely struggle with. Um, but, uh, but I, I, if, if your goal is, and this, this is what I wanted to say before and when I lost yeah. my train of thought, um, what drives me to continue doing what I do in the times that are hard are, are the pursuit of, of beauty in some way. I, I, I like to make music that makes me 
makes me feel not outwardly, but makes me feel beautiful. Like I, I, I like to make a, a beautiful sound. I like to, to watch my peers do beautiful stuff. I don't know. And it's, I don't mean like it ha- everything has to be a luscious string arrangement. It, it, like beautiful can be an octafuzz into a tube screamer, but it's like the pursuit of making something um, that makes you feel great. Yeah. That to me, that to me, it, you will, you will feel successful if that's your goal every time you do it. And like that time we've probably talked about this a little, uh, like, but when you, when you come to your guitar with that intention, you will always play something great. If you walk up to the microphone at a show with the intention to just make your, make yourself feel good. Guess what? Your audience is going to feel it. And they're going to have a great time. If you walk up there going like, I've got this, I've got this line of licks that I just want to play so I can impress everybody. And then they're going to walk away saying, wow, that might be the best guitar player I've ever seen. You're, it's not going to happen. No, you're not going to connect because the thing that, and we've all experienced it. The thing that we connect with when we hear somebody do something incredible is their humanity. It's not necessarily their skill. When I hear somebody shred on the guitar, I don't necessarily connect with it unless it's coming from that place of like, you know, when, when Stevie Ray Vaughan plays like a blistering line of notes, I'm not impressed by the skill of it. I'm impressed by the emotional output. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so if that's your goal and as a songwriter, your goal is to share your story, then you're already successful, you know, and that's what art exists for. And I think that if you pursue that and you, and you stay the course on that, then you will find some kind of, some kind of success in the more traditional sense. You know, if you keep at it and you keep just trying to share your story and share your personality, tell people what you're all about. Um, you'll find an audience because that, that, and that's, that's what I think, you know, uh, success for me is just finding like-minded people who feel the same way about the music that I, you know, feel the same way about music that I feel. And, um, and that's, I don't know. I'm blabbing again. No, it's fine. It makes for good podcasting. Uh, and I, actually, so I, I have so many more things we, I want to talk about. Things like uh, you talked about string arrangements and lush arrangements and stuff like that. And actually, I want to talk about how you do that with guitar and, you know, actually talk about guitar on a guitar podcast. But we're actually run, we're, well, we're running up on time. So what we're going to do, I'm going to take this moment to thank my Patreon supporters. And then we're going to go over to the Patreon episode. Listeners, I know. I'm sorry. We're going to actually talk about guitar on the bonus content episode. I know. I'm sorry, but we, we get to talking and we have lots of things we want to talk about. Um, the last time I saw Joey in person, he was playing in Nashville at the city winery. He came out and we talked outside and like, at some point we had to be like, Hey, you, you need to go. Uh, cause it's like, we're having a great conversation, but it's getting late and like the guys are tearing down gear and, you know, forcing you to yeah, get and up you, and go I do can the o- thing. I can only let the band tear down my stuff. So many times before <laughs> I start getting rocks put on my pillow. Yeah, exactly. So. so Patreon supporters, thank you for all your support. Uh, Going to call you out all by name. Duncan Watson, Andy Johns, David Evangelista of the Guitar Dads podcast, Josh Gierkin, Blake Jefferson, Nick Call, Andrew Hensley, Alan Gresham, Dan Pilver of Lewitt Microphones, Scott Hamilton of the Effects Loop podcast, Andy Koning, Jim Burns, Tom Kelly, Heath Bat, Ben Fair of Electromotive Sound Pedals, Rick Calhoun of Honey Picks, Jeffrey Wax, and Kyle Harris. Thank you for your support. You literally keep the show going. Uh, I can't do it without y'all. So, Joey, uh, where can everybody find you? Anything before we sign? Actually, I do have one last thing. This is going to be it. And then we're going to say where they can find you. Of course, it's all in the links below if you click below because I'm going to like there's going to be so many links, y'all. Just go down and click the links. Link um, City. So I added this segment in the last few episodes, and I'm actually pretty sure I stole this from Zach uh, Broyles of Great. Mythos Pedals on his podcast. Because um, I came up with it on spur of the moment during a podcast, and then I realized I stole it. Well, I'm going to live with it now. So um, so on a gear note, is there anything right now that you're like, I need to get one of those? What are you gassing for? Like, what do you want that you don't have? Oh, Okay, well, I, you know what? It's not that I don't have it. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for, 
I'm looking for somebody who has made um, a Maxon SD9 with more bottom end. Okay. Yeah, I have like because I I I've I'm a big Mike Landau fan, and I I went out and picked myself in uh, on a like an, a spur of the moment thing. I picked up an Analog Man modded SD9, mm-hmm. and I loved it. I used it. It was my main drive sound all last last year for tour. But then you just lose so much bottom. And it's funny because like when I when I read like forums, people talking about because I'm constantly like Googling to see if somebody has made one. Yeah. They're like, oh, the bottom end just thumps. And I'm like, man, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's just me. But like I, it, it, I just lose all like all bottom end. Anyway, so if somebody knows where to find one, uh, the analog modern man one is really, really great. Analog man modern one is really great. But I'm I'm looking for something that just has a little more booty. All right. Well, that's awesome. Um, it, with that, we will wrap up this episode. Go over to Patreon. Y'all, thank you for your support. Thank you for listening. Click the links below to find the Bros Landreth on all the things. Patreon, YouTube, Spotify. I'll leave a Spotify link down there, but I'll leave a link to the website. And do y'all still use Bandcamp? You still got stuff up on Bandcamp? We do. Yeah, okay. we do. Bandcamp awesome. is great. I'll add a link to that as well because Bandcamp pays better, y'all. Support your artists. Uh, They do. Yeah. In the meantime, though, as always, be good to yourselves, be kind to each other, and make some noise. This episode is brought to you by the supporters of 40 Watt Podcast over on Patreon. Go over to patreon.com slash 40 Watt Podcast, where for as little as $3 per month, you can help support the podcast and get every episode ad-free. For $5 a month, you'll get every episode ad-free as well as a bonus episode every week. I can't overstate how thankful I am for the support of my patrons and hope you'll consider joining the team and helping keep this show on the road.